Um, professionals I'll have you know. How's everyone doing? You guys, I said, how is everyone doing? <laughs> wow, so much energy. <laughs> that is good. Um, my name is Amira Sackett. I'm here with these two lovely women. And we are um, excited to be part of the Green Belt Festival and excited to have this um, discussion today with you. Um, so we're going to start with introductions, and it's not about the burqa, is the title of a book written by Miriam right here, and so she's going to introduce herself, and then we have Sophia to introduce herself, and I will also introduce myself. Yeah. Um, okay, so I feel like I'm really loud, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Okay, we're good, okay. Um, hi, I'm Mariam uh, Khan. I am the editor of It's Not About the Burqa, um, which is exactly that, not about the burqa. Um, and the book is basically a collection of essays on faith, feminism, sexuality, and race. And it's 17 different Muslim women talking about lots of things um, outside of sort of the narrative that people associate with Muslim women about terrorism and hijabs and workers and all of that good stuff there's more to our lives as well so that's interesting to know um and so i'll uh let sophia talk who's one of the contributors to the collection as well thank you hi everyone and um, so i'm sophia ahmed um, and as mariam said i'm one of the contributors um i am a children's author and also a girls rights activist and my essay in the book is titled um the first feminist so the um, the woman who has been my role model my whole life, um, but I'll be talking about her a bit later on. Wonderful. My name is Amira Sake. I'm visiting from Chicago, um, and I am a dancer, choreographer, and also activist in Chicago. Um, I do hip-hop dance. I'm a B-girl, which means breaking, break girl, break dancing. <laughs> and I also do a style called popping, which started on the West Coast. And I will be performing, um, my show is called Love Embraces All, and I'll be performing that at the Playhouse on uh, tomorrow, 445, so make sure you check it out. And I'm very pleased to be here and very inspired to meet other Muslim women um, and that are doing their thing, um, which is exciting. Um, so I am going to, just to give you some context uh, for the book, I am going to read the introduction, which sort of help, will help you sort of place things. And then I'm going to go on to sort of read a little bit from my essay. Um, so, yeah. In January 2016, the Daily Telegraph reported on a private conversation in which David Cameron said he considered Muslim women to be traditionally submissive. The response to this, the response to his comments was anything but. Photographs of Muslim women holding up placards explaining exactly how they were not traditionally submissive spread across the internet. These women were everything from war survivor to PhD student, from mother to doctor. As I watched it all unfold online, I realized that I was always hearing things about Muslim women, things about who we were and who we were supposed to be and how we were supposed to act. When was the last time you heard a Muslim woman speak for herself without a filter or outside the white gaze on her own terms or outside the narrative built around us by media and governments? If Muslim women are to progress in society, if Muslim women are to be treated with respect, then it's so important that we challenge the narrative built around us. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? 
We should be the authors of our own narrative and identity. We should be the ones speaking about us. It's not about the burqa brings together Muslim women's voices. It does not represent the experiences of every Muslim woman or claim to cover every single issue faced by Muslim women. It's not possible to create that book. But this book is a start of movement. We Muslim women are reclaiming and rewriting our identity. Here are essays about hijab and wavering faith, about love and divorce, about queer identity, about sex, about the twin threats of a disapproving community and a racist country, and about how Islam and feminism go hand in hand. Every essay in this book is unfinished because each one is the beginning of a very necessary conversation. By using the word burqa on the front cover of this collection of essays, it's frustrating that even now I'm having to engage with a narrative that Muslim women have never created. Burqa is a word that has been politicized and has become synonymous with Muslim female identity. It's another element in the narrative written around us by others. By engaging with this narrative, I hope to dismantle it from within. Muslim women are more than burqas, more than hijabs, and more than society has allowed us to be until now. We are not asking for permission anymore. We are taking up space. We've listened to a lot of people talking about who Muslim women are without actually hearing Muslim women. So now we are speaking, and now it's your turn to listen. So that's my introduction. Sorry. Um, just a little bit more for me. Stay with me. Um, so, it's, so now I'm going to read um, a few parts uh, from my essay in the book, which, again, stay with me. It's called Feminism Needs to Die, um, and it will all make sense, hopefully, by the end of it, or by the event, end of this event. <laughs> Otherwise, just ask me questions at the end. Anyway, um, so this is my essay, Feminism Needs to Die. Islam is a religion that empowers women. And yet for many young Muslim girls, their understanding of Islam comes entirely from a series of cultural interpretations of their faith dictated by the patriarchy. With this and the lack of conversation within their communities about women's rights, the first time many Muslim girls in the West will encounter female empowerment is likely to be from a white feminist perspective. But there is a problem. This perspective disapproves of the hijab the burqa, modest culture, and other key elements of the Muslim female identity. Mainstream feminism suggests that my choices and values can't exist within its framework. If I make the decision to dress for my faith, then I must be oppressed or submissive. Before I go any further, I need to explain exactly what I mean by white feminism and how I'll use this term for the purposes of this essay. White feminism, which is still the mainstream, centers the agenda and needs of white, straight, middle class, cis, able bodied women while making claims that it speaks on behalf of all women. White feminism doesn't recognize that my identity as a Muslim and a person of color cannot be set aside in the pursuit of equality for all women. Every white feminist I've come across will argue until they are blue in the face that women should have the right to decide how to dress themselves. And then those same people are unwilling to stand up for a Muslim woman who wears a hijab or burqa because they don't believe in it or feel like Muslim women are oppressed. They can't entirely explain or point to the oppressor, neither can they acknowledge that they themselves are playing the role of oppressor by impressing their ideology of empowerment on others who may interpret empowerment in a different way. So I found, a so I found being a feminist taxing because I am so emphatically othered in a movement that should represent all women. The terms of my empowerment as a woman are dictated by what white feminism and the West perceives as empowering. Bear with me, bear with me. I'm a woman, but I'm also a Muslim and a person of color, and these identities cannot be separated. I can't set aside being a woman of color when it comes to being a feminist, and I can't set aside being a Muslim woman when it comes to being a feminist. More to the point, I will not set it aside. Somehow within feminism, there is an expectation that faith needs to be left at the door. 
I'm so tired of conversations about how Islam treats women when in actuality the person lecturing me doesn't even know how Islam says Muslim women should be treated. I believe we should all exclusively identify as intersectional feminists. In doing this, we are allowing ourselves to recognize how power structures overlap and reinforce each other and how feminism today is dominated by white, cisgendered, middle-class, able-bodied women who refuse to acknowledge the multiple layers of oppression women of color have to go through. If white feminists can't if white feminists want to be a part of the narrative, they will need to decenter themselves and their views of empowerment to include women of color, trans women, non-binary women, gender queer people, and women of faith. Empowerment comes in many forms and oppression shouldn't be defined by what isn't default to a white feminist worldview. Feminism, as we know it, needs to die so it can stop building walls, so it can develop and move forward to nurture a sisterhood of intersectional feminists. Feminism is no good to me if it doesn't fight for every different type of woman. Thank you. So just as a reminder, um, this book is for sale at G Books, and she will sign your book today uh, directly after um, our discussion today, so definitely keep that on the radar. So after the discussion, you just head down a few tents and you can get a signed copy from Miriam, which I think we all want one now. That was amazing. Um, so let's just open a few questions. Um, you talked about like this sing a singular narrative. And why do you think that this singular narrative about Muslim women exists? I feel like I've done a lot of talking already. <laughs> um, I think that there is a singular narrative, and I think that it's not necessarily exclusive to Muslim women. I think a lot of people deal with a lot of singular narratives around them. And I think those are called stereotypes. We are all familiar with them. But I think stereotypes occur so those in power can control those around them um, to be in one specific way because you can't control people who aren't a part of an like an entity who are you know individuals and so stereotypes happen so those who are being stereotyped can be controlled and it's easier to uh, influence or to um, suggest groups are in a particular way if the mass if the uh if the monolithic uh, narrative around them is one and the same. Um, so I think that stereotypes happen so those in power can control those who are not in power, basically. Um, and then I think it benefits those, for those, those in power for those stereotypes to continue to exist. Um, do you want to add anything? No. Okay. I said it all. <laughs> and I think also... Um I mean, in the, in the United States, I think any minority group, like you were saying, uh, is a victim of these stereotypes and then is also expected to speak on behalf of a ton of people, which is just super unfair, right? Because we're not a monolith. We're very diverse. We come from different backgrounds. Um, you know, the majority of Muslims are actually Asian. Yeah. People don't realize that. They think everyone who's Muslim is from the Middle East. That's not true. Right. So but even then, that so in this, so I guess more so from the UK side, um, a lot of the times when we do talk about Muslim people, uh, the representation of those people in our media is South Asian, and that's incredibly problematic because, like you said, there is Arabs, there is Somalians, there is so many different um, sort of iterations and diversity around what a Muslim individual looks like, and those narratives aren't coming to the forefront, and you would have to think, why? Why aren't those narratives being told? Why isn't the depth and diversity of this group of people being told? Like, who does that benefit? Does that benefit the group? Who does it, you know, does it benefit those in power? Um, and I think it's, it's different to the US. So maybe like the dominant group there being like, I don't know, Arabs, I guess. I don't know, I, not US. I think, I think in the US, there's definitely, because of the interests of the United States, I think that it's uh, constantly people associate Muslims with the Middle East. Mm. So when I tell them they're, you know, that Malaysia is a Muslim country, predominantly Muslim country, they're like, what? Like, <laughs> there's very little 
like I feel known mm. outside of uh, you know the Middle East, the the what the media has presented mm. to um, to the population, mm. right? So that's what they're going off of. Um, and so yeah, there's definitely differences. I mm. feel like. Um, Islam has existed and Muslims have existed in the UK longer. Yeah. I mean, in the public eye, and mm -hmm. I feel like Muslims in the US, we are growing, but there's a lot of uh, immigration that's happened in maybe the last 20 years, right? So it's like a little bit different. Um, and in the US, I think there's definitely an interesting um, portion of people for, that have been forgotten about in the US, which is our like our heroes for Muslim Americans are Malcolm X and uh, Muhammad Ali, for example, from the black community in the US. And so our earliest Muslims actually came through slavery to the US. And I feel like a lot of people are kind of don't remember that. Mm. So that's something that we talk a lot about is just recognizing that Muslims have been a fabric mm. of the US since the beginning. Mm. Um, let me ask you, also, um, so you kind of spoke on, um, you know, what made you write this essay. Mm. Um, was there like one pivotal moment where you were like, I'm done? Um, I sort of addressed this in my introduction. Um, but for me, uh, like the importance of this book comes from um, sort of me growing up and not being able to find the first time I read a book that had a Muslim, hijabi, Pakistani uh, woman in it, I was 22 or 23. I'm 26 now. And that's a long time to wait to see yourself reflected in uh, a book. And for me, the reason why books hold prominence is because I worked in publishing. And also I, because I was a geek at school, I um, volunteered in my school library for five years and didn't find a book that represented me. And then I, whilst I stayed there for college, I also volunteered there for college whilst I was at college too. And I still didn't find a book that represented me. And so to wait that long and to work in a space where you're surrounded by books and just never find yourself. And, and that sort of, for me, that reflected that I wasn't important in society, that I didn't need to be there, that people were speaking for me. So surely like a narrative was being around um, me and people like me that would benefit me. Of course it wasn't. No one's interested in putting out anyone else's narrative in a way that will benefit those people. And so what I learned from that absence was that or what I sort of internalized from that absence was that my narrative wasn't important. But then when I, what I learned when I went to university was that the, the absence of that narrative or narrative driven by someone like me or uh, me, basically, was that other people could speak for me and that they would say things and monopolize on my identity and I wouldn't be able to recognize who they wanted me to be. And so it, it was just... It was just frustrating. It was a lot of frustration to have yourself. For me, a lot of the time in media when Muslim women come up, it's burqas and hijabs and oppression. And I'm not saying that those conversations aren't important or that need to be had, but I'm saying that there is more to Muslim women um, than what we see in the media. And it's what the book shows. The, the book talks about um, being queer and being a hijabi Muslim woman. The book sh uh, talks about um, uh, being sexually empowered as a Muslim woman and there being no shame in that. The book talks about the difference between culture and identity, uh, culture and religion, which for me was a key thing growing up because... I felt like I I was liberated as a as a person of faith once I realized that culture and religion were two separate things. Um, the book talks about divorce. The book talks about um, you know being a Muslim by heritage. It talks about so many different conversations that we could carry on forever that we don't hear from a Muslim. Muslim people or a, a Muslim community and there's conversations that we're not allowed to have why are we not allowed to have that those conversations and it's kind of that people have taken part of uh, the Muslim female identity and they've made it the entire encompassing thing about those people um, which is incredibly unfair and that's what this book is about it's about telling people that we're there's there's many uh, parts to to who we are not just the one thing that they constantly are told in the media and in the press and by the politicians, etc.
wonderful. Um, I, you know, to quote Rumi, I do a lot of work using Rumi, and Rumi says, where the wound is, the light enters you, right? So wherever there's something that hurts, that's where the light enters. And I feel that um, collectively, the three women you see on this stage, and also a lot of Muslims in uh, the recent um, years have really taken it upon themselves to speak up for themselves after kind of years of hearing about us from other people. And so I think that's kind of the beauty of, of the negative things that happened, that there is now a light shining from us as well to educate, to, um, to tell our story from our viewpoint. Now, Miriam, do you feel that it is um, that we have a duty to inform those who have a miseducated or misinterpreted understanding of Muslim women? Uh, I think that it's tiring for me as a Muslim person to constantly have to prove my humanity to people. So um, I was at another festival last weekend and um, we did an hour long talk about like Muslim identity and how it's so diverse. And we talked about, you know, on the stage, there was between the three of us that were doing an event, it was a, a different, you know, trio. It was um, a screenwriter, a poet, and an editor and writer, so me. Um, and, you know, there's, there's so much in that. And, you know, we did this whole conversation around, you know, different things. And none of us mentioned FGM, none of us mentioned forced marriage. And at the end, someone puts their hand up as they do every single event and you know so what do you think about forced marriages and I was just like what do you think I think about them like to sit I just did an hour-long talk about the depth of like the a Muslim female identity and about how we're not allowed to talk about different things and about how there's certain parts of like the things that have been associated with our identity that have completely monopolized it. And all you heard in your brain was the assumptions that you brought to the conversation. Um, so in that question, I declined to answer because it's kind of, when someone asks me that, what I think of is the response in my head is, well, what do you think of the Holocaust? It was really shit. It was wrong. We all agree. Like, so why do I now need to prove to you that I think FGM is wrong? Like, it's not associated with Islam, it's a cultural practice. But often I think it's tiring and what we can get into is people like me who are different to the majority, who have to come into a room and first prove our humanity to then be listened to um, or, or for someone to take us seriously as if I'm inhumane, as if somehow I like the suffering of others and you need to make a judgment on, based on my values, whether I agree with those those things when those things are not even a part of who I am. Um, so I think that, and what we can do is backpedal into this idea of you not doing any of the work or uh, not you, but like as in the predominant, uh, uh, those in the predominant narrative, not doing any of the work for educating themselves and constantly expecting to be educated. The internet's a pretty much, I can say this in this country, I think the internet's free. You can go and use it, go and use it at your libraries. Like the, there's books, you can read them. You don't necessarily need to ask me what I think or what Islam, what I think as a Muslim of FGM or forced marriage or, you know, those things are available to you. Um, so I think that it's, it's a give and a take because exactly what I just said, we've done in this book, right? We've opened up different narratives to you. So I think that when, I think that there's, there's a give and a take. I don't, mind as a Muslim woman talking about my faith and my identity. But when it comes to my faith and identity being used as a measurement for my humanity, I have a problem with me being perceived in that way. I feel, yes, but. <laughs> and we're not, we're not leaving Sophia out, by the way. Yes, we're gonna get talk. to her, okay? It's She's not, just over here, you. quiet. <sighs> What she said. <laughs> We're going to ask her plenty of questions, too. I'll shut up eventually, guys. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting in listening to you speak, uh, Miriam, just the difference a little bit, uh, you know, the perspective in the United States and kind of the work that I do. I find people um, 
I go to a lot of small towns in the U.S. where they have never met a Muslim before. So they're listening to uh, um, the media's presentation of Muslims, and they have a lot of false stories going around among themselves. So I also have been completely like, you know, it's insulting for someone to ask you, and this happened to me at one of my performances, why do Muslims say Allahu Akbar before they kill someone? And I was like, number one, we don't kill people. <laughs> um, that's like criminals that kill people. I was just like, what is that question, right? But there's a part of me that has to put that aside because I actually do, I don't feel like you said, I don't feel it's a duty. But I feel that- I don't feel it's a duty either. Right. Because I think that it's a, it's a gift to be able to express yourself. So this book is giving you these narratives, but you have to pick up and read it, right? And so then you are educating yourself and getting multiple perspectives from different Muslims, right? And women at the same time. Um, however, in my, in my experience in the U.S., I take every question, I go, okay, give it to me, even if it's like crazy to me, but I answer it. And, um, but it is, it is really amazing to see how much false information is out there. And I agree with you at this point, I feel like, you know, if you're hearing so much about a group of people, you should probably take time to do a little research before just formulating ideas about them. However, there's just people that that just quickly, it doesn't involve them because they don't know any Muslims. There's no Muslims in their town. But those people know aliens and those are fictional. So True. So, <laughs> and they know, they know Star Trek and Star Wars and they know, somebody name me a movie quickly, anything. Mm -hmm. Harry Potter and he's right. fictional and they probably know what Harry Potter's favorite color is as well. And like his parents' name and his grandparents' history. So then for me to like... Like I said, like I can understand there being small groups and small communities and not everyone being exposed in the same way. But then this is where that line is drawn of how much work am I going to do for you to see me as human? And how much work are you going to do for you to see me human? Because there's a line and we've got to meet somewhere. Otherwise, I'm doing the work and you're not doing anything. Um, and if you can go out of your way to get yourself to see Harry Potter and, you know, all about his biography than me being an actual person in this real world um, and there being, like, something less than, what, two billion Muslims in the world, you should potentially give me some time, too, you know? I'm not asking for much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bring her to the U.S. and she can say that also. <laughs> because I answer a lot of questions. I mean, you like, have what? Trump, so but, really, yeah, you're like, losing either way. There's some, there's some tough, <laughs> tough times uh, that we're facing there as Muslims, um, definitely. Um, so let's turn it over. Let's have uh, oh, sorry, Sophia. Sorry. And you're going to read an excerpt from your essay, correct? So um, my essay is called The First Feminist, and I'll do a short reading. It was Confucius who said that you cannot open a book without learning something. A book can make a home for itself in both your heart and mind, and it can provide a direction you need to succeed in life. I was 12 years old when my father handed me such a gift. It wasn't a thick book, more like a pamphlet, and the quality of the pages left a lot to be desired as it was printed cheaply, probably in India or Pakistan. The cover was simple, a white background with a crescent and star, and the words were written in Urdu, historically the language of the Islamic elite in the latter period of the Mughal Empire. As a Muslim of Indian heritage, in addition to learning to recite the Quran in Arabic, I was expected to learn to speak, read, and write Urdu from a very young age. The sole purpose of acquiring this language was so that I could learn about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I read about his life after his birth to his childhood, when he was orphaned after the death of his widowed mother and raised by his paternal grandfather, then later his uncle in Mecca. I learned about his young adult life when he developed a reputation as an honest and trustworthy trader, all the way to the man he became around the age of 40 when he received the revelation about the one God, the most merciful and the most just. The book my father gave me, however, was not about Prophet Muhammad, and although flimsy in appearance, it was the one that sowed the seeds of feminism in my mind. It taught me that the foundations of my faith were fairness and justice, and that God does not promote gender inequality. 
The book was about a woman who lived 1400 years ago. Her name was Khadija bin Walid, and she was the beloved wife of Prophet Muhammad. They married when he was 25 years old and she was 40, and remained together until her death. Although polygamy was standard practice in their tribe, the Prophet was faithful to her throughout their marriage, refusing to take a second wife. Khadija is known to Muslims as a mother of believers for her position as the Prophet's first wife. She also holds the title of first Muslim as she was the first person to accept the Prophet's message of the one merciful God. But what fascinated me about Khadija had nothing to do with her role as a wife and mother. It was her professional life and business acumen that drew me to her like a magnet and made her my role model. And in all the times when I have felt othered or my confidence uh, has taken a knock, she came to the rescue to lift me right back up. Prophet Muhammad's tribe was known as the Quraysh, a community of traders who lived in Mecca. Within that tribe, Khadija was a successful businesswoman. Actually, let's not talk down her achievements. She was the wealthiest merchant in Mecca and was known as Al-Tahira, the pure one for honesty and integrity. The book my father gave me celebrated Khadija. It celebrated her wealth and it, most importantly, it celebrated the fact that she was reliant on no man. Her feminism was about a woman's right to be independent of anyone else. Khadija's business and her money belonged to her, and that gave her freedom. It was this sense of freedom that really struck me. It was the opposite of what my patriarchal Asian culture tried to enforce on women, and what was enacted and enforced by women who were complicit in their own oppression. In the eyes of the aunties in my community, all women belonged to fathers, brothers, husbands, and finally, in old age, to adult sons. A woman could not have full autonomy over her life and all choices were steered towards the benefit of her male relatives. Even as a young child, I was fully aware that I was different from everyone else because my mother had been a single parent who had then remarried. It was a courageous and unique thing for a young immigrant woman to do, and yet I was surrounded by a community that disapproved of this sort of independence. Any attempt to challenge the traditional roles was met with disapproval that quickly spread through gossip and manifested as social control. What will people say is a line that many Asians use to control the choices of their children, especially daughters. Don't stay in the family honour is another line drummed into young minds as if girls and women are walking vessels through which the family can be judged on worthiness and respect. So there was a very another personal reason why Khadija's independence resonated with me. It made me realise that the choice to live on one's own terms was not forbidden in my religion. It gave me the choice to reject a patriarchal culture that controlled women's movements and especially the ones that boxed them into relationships that were unhappy or violent. And it became all the more important to me because of my own mother's experience. I was born into a broken home. My mother arrived as a 17-year-old in the 1970s to an industrial mill town in Greater Manchester. She made the journey from India to marry a distant relative in a match arranged by her mother, my nanny ma. My mother initially lived with her older cousins, sister, uh, sisters who had followed the same path a few years earlier to marry men chosen by their parents. She has often spoken of the shock she and her cousins felt at the life that they were expected to lead. These young women hailed from middle-class land-owning families in Gujarat in West India. They grew up with wealth and status and were now expected to live in tiny terrace houses, cold and damp with outside loos. Within weeks of my mother's arrival to this new land, she dutifully married my biological father. The marriage failed to last six months and they separated. Concerned for her daughter thousands of miles away, my nanima paid for my mum to fly back to India. It was only after she returned to India that my mother revealed to my nanima that she was pregnant. In many other families, this news would have been met with consternation. Traditional roles dictate that daughters should remain within their marriages, regardless of their treatment. My nanima did not subscribe to this view. She was a strong woman of independent mind, a financial supporter of poor widows and divorces in the village. She believed in a woman's right to not just live on her own terms, but to live those choices with dignity and respect. Naturally, she fully supported her own daughter and celebrated my birth. As the first grandchild, I was absolutely adored by my grandparents and uncles and aunts, and it did not matter that I was a girl rather than a boy. Stories of boys being valued over girls is nothing new in South Asia. Boys are regarded as breadwinners for elderly parents, whereas girls are seen as burdens who have to be married off with dowries. I have engaged in enough women's rights activism to know that the belief that sons are better than daughters is a huge problem in some parts of the world, especially in India. For those who have little knowledge of Islam, there is the assumption that Muslim women's oppression stems from Islamic teachings, and this is simply not the case. 
In fact, Muslim imams preach about the value of daughters, often citing that a daughter opens the gates of paradise for a father. Indeed, the person most beloved to Prophet Muhammad was his youngest daughter, Fatima. Islamic teachings declare that a father has to fulfill his duty to raise and care for his daughters, and the obligations go beyond providing financial support. He must provide a safe, peaceful and loving home environment that is conducive to his daughter's overall spiritual and moral development. My own mother's family has always believed that their faith teaches them to value daughters, but not everyone in the wider community agreed. The imam sermons about valuing daughters fell on many deaf ears, allowing the cultural practice of viewing daughters as burdens to flourish. The labels of single-parent divorcee and fatherless girl were attached to my mother as news of my birth spread. My mother faced a stark choice. On the one hand, we could remain at her parents' home under their protection, or she could return to England with me as a baby of British descent. My mother knew that England could give me everything that would be denied to me in a wealthy but parochial rural community that dictated that girls remain in the home. England could give me an education and allow me to stand on my own two feet. It could give me what she craved, independence. So my mother chose England and she chose it for me. Stop there. Okay, did you learn something from that chapter? Um, what Sophia was talking about was uh, realizing that Islam and culture are two different things, right? The teachings of Islam and the cultural practices are two different things, but a lot of times they are put together, even by the Muslims of that culture. So there's confusion as far as what is the cultural practice and what is it is part of Islam. And so then it's confusing also if you are a person of other faith to understand, maybe you know a Muslim and they have this certain practice, is that Islam or is that their culture? Um, it's the same way that, you know, when we look at like Catholicism, the way that it's practiced here versus the way that it's practiced in Mexico, there's differences, right, in practice. Um, and I think that's the important thing to realize about Islam. And I think every Muslim woman adores uh, Khadija, peace and blessings be upon her family. Uh they do, the ones that know about her. Mm -hmm. But I do feel that um, within the Muslim community itself, um, we don't know her as the independent, financially independent woman that she was. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, the patriarchal culture tries to promote her as a wife and a mother. Mm -hmm. um, and she was much, much more than that. Um, so, you know, if we're looking for feminists, if we're looking to save ourselves, if you like, we just need to look at our own religion, our own... Um, you know, the figures from our own history. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there are so many reasons um, why she's sidelined in that sense. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think um, just on that as well, what that was making me think of is um, Muslim women and how on both fronts we're trying to fight something. So as a British Muslim woman, I'm having to deal with the same crap of the women deal with with the Western patriarchy. And then as a Muslim woman, I'm having to deal with the crap that the community puts at me. So culture as patriarchy or patriarchy as culture, whichever one you want to take. And how often, how I start my essay is often when we do come to like role models, um, they are white feminists and white women who in their own rights have done incredible things. But history is told from a certain narrative, a certain viewpoint. And often I wonder, and um, even now I wonder, if that narrative was more diverse, what women like me and girls like me and younger girls would, um, and how much they would believe in themselves if they saw women like Khadija in their history lessons as well. Because just like I'm... I learn about incredible, you know, women uh, who have influenced um, British history. I don't think there's anything wrong with um, non-Muslim uh, girls learning about incredible Muslim women. And I think actually that mix of like education and seeing that there are role models and feminists and activists and enter title here, uh, women, that you, you, they can inspire all women is something that can help us pr all progress as feminists instead of keeping to the idea that, so 
the the Muslim feminists have to keep the Muslim feminists and like the white feminists have to keep to the white women and like the black women have to keep to the black feminists like that what we won't progress that way um so it's just making me think about that as you were talking I love that point um also as a side note Miriam's name also exists in the Quran. So in case you didn't know, we have an entire book called Maryam. And it's about Mary, peace be upon her, the mother of Isa or Jesus, peace be upon him. So just so you know, we also share role models uh, with Christians, right? So it would be... And Jewish, Sarah and, and Hagar. Yes. Right, yes. And so I think that um, that's a beautiful point. Like it would be... Wonderful for people of other faiths to know about Khadijah and Fatima mm. and how important they are uh, for Muslims and what strong, beautiful women that we have as role models. Mm. Um, all right, this question goes to both of you kind of on that subject. Um, talking about, Miriam touched on it, like some of the um, problems in our own community, mm. do you think internal community dialogue is important? Internal community dialogue? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, if, we want, if we feel we want to change things, we need to talk amongst ourselves. Um, you know, if, uh, so Maria Melia touched upon um, the subjects that kind of make it, uh, that are topical issues like FGM she mentioned, forced mm. marriage. Um, we do... There are issues, you know, like there are issues in every community. Um, but we need to be able to affect that change. There can't be top-down change. There can't be a white celebrity woman who says, I'm going to campaign for FGM because no one's going to listen to her. Um, and, and that sort of promotes the white saviour yeah, idea as well. Yeah, yeah. So that change has to come from uh, within us. And also, um, like when I talk about my feminism, I'm talking as a British woman and I'm talking as a Muslim woman and I'm only talking about British Muslim feminism. I'm not talking for the women that live in Saudi Arabia or the women that live in Iran. Um, probably have a, some stuff in common with you as an American because mm -hmm. we're looking at Western stuff. But um, it's important to understand that I'm not looking to save all those other women. I'm talking about the changes that we need to have in this country. And culture is fluid. Yeah, we can, it changes all the time. And just because we have inherited certain patriarchal traditions doesn't mean that they have to continue. Because here, as a British woman, I am independent, I am educated, I'm all those things that my mum wanted me to be. And then why can't I affect that change here? Um, also, uh, so in the book, um, the first essay, uh, it's by um, a... So, shall I say journalist and activist Mona El Tahawi. Um, she works for the New York Times and she's amazing um, and in her book she talks about um, how uh, the, as a woman it's like standing in the middle of a seesaw and how if we try and have community dialogues um, inside our communities men are saying stop having those conversations because you're going to make us look bad and then exactly that happens because everyone takes those conversations outside of those communities and co-ops them and then what we have is Islamophobia and racism and so the community on the inside is like you're making us look bad and on the outside is the racism and Islamophobia and you're standing there in the middle and you're thinking oh my god I have to balance everything and in her essay she has this part where she talks about being a Muslim woman in this world means jumping off from that seesaw and basically saying a big F you to everyone. Um, because you, you would not need to do anything if everyone in the community was behaving and you would not need to do anything if everyone wasn't, you know, outside of community, that narrative wasn't being co-opted and being made Islamophobic. So actually, it's everyone else who has the problem and you're just doing the work to point it out. And often as Muslim women, as women and Muslim um, people of color, we're the ones who are demonized for pointing out things within our community. But the thing that frustrates me is that there are certain narratives that just need to happen within the community and there's no spaces for those narratives within the Muslim community to happen because they're never allowed to happen because of Islamophobia and racism. And we cannot top down deal with those things as Sophia mentioned, if we are not allowed to have conversations within our community and with those people. Um, so that's not to say, oh yeah, let's cover things up because women like me and many other women 
are not here for anyone's crap, basically. But what we're saying is you need to have the respect that we have, the agency and the intellect to deal with inner community crap, basically. So, yeah. Now, you're both creatives. So tell me, what do you have in the future coming up? in your creative process? Oh, I thought you were going to go first, oh, I am. <laughs> so I've got two picture books coming out in September, uh, one with Lady Bird, it is for the kids, um, and a couple of other projects um, that I'm looking to confirm before I can talk about them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but if Ooh, I could just tell you, you about my book that does ex that is already out there, um, it's YA, Young Adult, and it's um, called Secrets of the Henna Girl, which is a, a book about a young British girl, and she's her proposed forced marriage. Um, and I wrote that because um, I believe if we don't write our own stories, someone else is going to write them and then they're just going to be f full of stereotypes. Um, so, for example, I'll, I'll bring you to um, the last thing that was on TV that really wound me up was The Bodyguard. Did anybody see that? Yeah. Ugh. And I think to myself, you know, no did you comment. have any sen sensitivity, script writers, any readers? Uh, you, it's, it was just this awful... Um, series that um, the King of the North did from okay. Game of Thrones. I'll just call him, I can't remember his name. Um, so I wrote that book because I wanted to claim that narrative. So um, although she's being put through a forced marriage, she's standing up for herself. So there are no saviors in there. There's no white boyfriend that comes and takes her away. She stands up for herself and she doesn't reject her religion. She understands that it's cultural practice. Um, so I do believe that, you know, it's not a single story. You know, we have lots of stories, but when we have that story there, it's about um, uh, putting out the narrative that we want uh, from our community. Absolutely. That was awesome. Clap. You have to clap for that one. <laughs> um, I've very much just been doing lots and lots and lots of events um, because I've recently had a book out. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I've been just promoting It's Not Like a Burger, <laughs> if you didn't know. Um, I am working on other things but um as with being a creative I have to have a full-time job because this doesn't pay so stay in school kids um uh so yeah so just working on lots of different projects which I can't actually mention because nothing's confirmed so yeah uh in the meantime it's just promoting um this and writing um I do write I'm uh I'm a as in like journalism, um, not writing books. Um, I do write as well. So in the meantime, I do that as well. And I talk about lots of things about community and women and Islam and feminism and white feminism and all of those good conversations and constantly having them all the time, even in my sleep. So yeah. <laughs>